See the light. Sing this out with us. No, I won't boast, but in the cross that saved my soul. All else is lost. The grip of fear. No hold on me. So where, oh death, where is your sting? No longer I who live. Now Jesus lives in me. For I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. All of this and all, all of this for your glory. Clap those hands this morning. Come on. And all, all of this for your glory. And all, all of this for your glory. And all, all. Why don't you guys give a socially distanced hello to your neighbor this morning? You guys ready to sing today? I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures. Never enough. You came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. 
Jesus, I'm not. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of next song out with me this morning. Through every battle, through every heartache, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe the way, see that, the truth, the light, I believe you are the way, the truth. 
guys bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we enter this time of worship. Jesus, we invite you into this place this morning, Lord. We invite you into our hearts. I pray that no matter what's going on in our lives, Lord, that you would bring peace this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. 
Lift your hearts to Jesus this morning and sing all my life. Cause all my life you have been great. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am in, oh, I will sing of the good. the voices this morning. Sing all my life. Cause all my life you have been faith. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the most famous sermon ever preached, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, these statements that Jesus makes, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, known as the Beatitudes. So we've been going through them one at a time, line by line. And today we're going to pick up and we're going to continue this series in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And it talks about persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Uh, in other words, it's saying embrace righteous persecution because heaven will be yours. So the key word here is righteous. Righteous persecution is when you endure mistreatment because you're doing the right thing. Let me tell you what righteous persecution isn't. Righteous persecution isn't, uh, Pastor, my boss has it in for me. Uh, they're giving me a really hard time at work. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm being persecuted. I, I, I know that they, they told me that I might lose my job, and I know that I'm late every day, but it's usually only like a half hour or so, and, and, and sometimes it's more. But, but, you know, I have a really hard time waking up in the morning, so pray for me, Pastor, because my boss is persecuting me. That is not righteous persecution. That is uh, challenges that we bring upon ourselves. Or, or maybe it's this, Pastor, talk to my wife because she says if I don't start picking up my socks and, and putting my dishes in the sink, that her mom is going to come live with us. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm being persecuted. That's not righteous persecution either. Righteous persecution is more like when your boss asks you to do something that you know is wrong. 
uh, bill this guy a little extra or, or do some work off the, off the clock for me or if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And if you don't do it, it's going to make your life difficult at work. Uh, righteous persecution is when your family turns their back on you or attacks you for doing the right thing. That's righteous persecution. When you suffer, when we suffer for doing what's right. And, and these, uh, the, the Bible is full of examples of righteous persecution. These usually come as a result of someone making a decision to do what's right, even though it's not popular. And these, these moments of decision come at, at these intersections in our lives. Uh, we've all heard the term fork in the road. And so this is, this is not the fork in the road that, that we're going to talk about today. That's just a fork sticking in the road. Uh, but actually, a fork in the road is when you have a decision to make. The definition of that term fork in the road is it describes a deciding moment in your life when you're presented with two options or paths. And once you start down one road, it's difficult to go back. So we come to these moments in our lives, uh, this fork in the road, and we all, we all come to these moments. And these moments uh, uh, end up affecting us for the rest of our lives. And there's many times in our lives when we're just kind of wandering and, and life seems to move in a very uh, slow-moving current. It's very, um, it's very easy to, to predict what's going to happen next. It's predictable. But then there are these moments when we come to a crossroads and the decision that we have to make is going to affect everything from here on out. It's a big moment. Some of the, the big uh, cr fork in the road that we've experienced as, as a country recently was COVID, right? We all had decisions to make about what we were going to do and, and how we were going to handle this. And ultimately, those decisions that we made early on have affected us even today. Uh, some of the turning moments in my, or these crossroad, these fork in the mo road kind of moments, these turning points in my life, these, these moments when decisions were made that affected the rest of our lives were when my parents became Christians. They were the first Christians in their entire family on either side of the family. That was a major turning point for our family. Uh, when I became a Christian, that was a major turning point in my life when our kids were born. Uh, when our kids grew up and moved out, that was a that was a good one. But when uh, when our kids got married, uh, when Diane and I got married, that was a turning point uh, for both of us. When I graduated from high school after six of the best years of my life, uh, that was a turning point. And we you know, it's hard to preach when there's nobody here. Uh, I, I am not used to it anymore. We did that for 15 weeks during COVID. And now when I tell a joke, it's just quiet and I'm not used to it anymore. I miss you guys. It's, it's ironic that today, uh, a year to the week that we shut down our live services uh, for COVID, we did that for 15 weeks. One year later, exactly to the same weekend, we are shut down uh, our live services because of snow. Doesn't life have a weird sense of humor, a funny way of doing things. Anyway, uh, so some of the turning points in our lives are very obvious. And then uh, some, they're turning points for us, but nobody knows what happened. Nobody else is aware of what's going on. Like maybe you had a, a major financial setback and, and nobody knows. You didn't ever tell anybody. Or maybe maybe you were rejected or betrayed and, and, and nobody really knew. Maybe something someone did uh, made you May, or it hurts you or set you on a different path and, and you never really told anybody. But the decisions we make at those moments are critical because this is, this is kind of one of the big points I want you to take away today. What happens most is not what happens to you, but what happens in you because of what happens to you. Let me say that again. What, happens, what matters most is not what happens to us, but what happens in us because of what happens to us. And so God is so, so much more interested in our character and, and shaping us and molding us than he is about keeping us from even from pain. There are, there are moments in our lives where God will allow us to go through pain because he knows it's going to make us grow. God is very interested in this process and this, in this process that ex we experience. This is what Jeremiah chapter 6 says. It says, this is what the Lord says. This is Jeremiah talking to prophet. The God is saying, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that sound good? Finding rest for your soul. 
God wants to be a part of this process. He wants to be the one that we ask where the good way is. He, he's so much more concerned with who we're becoming than where we're going. And so uh, you, and you, we might not be able to control everything that happens to us, everything that happens at those intersections or those forks in the road, but we do have full control over how it affects us, over how we deal with it, over how we carry it or we don't carry it into our future. And so there's a, we're going to look at a story in the Bible, a character, and he's probably the, the premier character to talk about forks in the road and crossroads. Uh, there are none where his, his crossroads are more obvious, more visible, more impactful in his life. Uh, we don't see this kind of great example in anyone's life like we do in the life of Joseph. Now, there's a couple of Josephs in the Bible. This one isn't Mary's husband. He's, uh, we actually read this Joseph story in the book of Genesis. And so we're going to look at three different crossroads that he encountered. And we're going to go through his story kind of quickly this morning. Uh, we could spend a whole sermon series, and maybe someday we will, just on the life of Joseph. But Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons born to Jacob, who later had his name changed to Israel. And so when you think about the, when you hear the, the phrase, the 12 tribes of Israel, those 12 tribes refer to the 12 sons of, the, of this man named Israel, or Jacob, and God changed his name to Israel. And so Joseph is one of these, these 12 sons. And this is where we pick up his story. He's the favorite child of his father. So Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now this, this is messed up right here, all right? It's obvious everybody knows that dad loves Joseph more than he loves anybody else. So this is years of therapy for his brothers, right? This is, this is kind of a, a broken family, a bad family dynamic. And so um, Israel has a, a robe made just to show everybody how Joseph is his favorite son. So, and then, so it, it'd be like today if, if Israel took all of his kids to Walmart to buy their tennis shoes, but then he took Joseph to finish line and bought him Jordans. That's kind of what it would be like. It'd be like uh, Israel made all of his sons buy their own first car, but he took Joseph and bought him a brand new Camaro. It would be like that. So, so there's a lot of resentment in this family. There's a lot of dysfunction in this family. And to top it off, Joseph starts having these dreams that God gives him. But instead of being humble about it, he starts to brag about it. He starts to brag to his brothers. This is what, it, what happens. Genesis 37, verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around it, around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Sometimes you don't need to share everything with everyone. And Joseph, God gives him, this is a God-given dream. God gives it to him a couple different ways. And God's trying to teach him something. But instead of trying to get the lesson and learn this lesson, Joseph starts to brag to his brothers and say, hey, look, at one day you, all you guys are going to bow down to me. Even mom and dad are going to bow down to me. This is a Muhammad Ali. And he was a three-time world heavyweight boxing champion. No one had ever done that. No one had ever unified the belts before, before Muhammad Ali did it. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated more times than any other athlete in their history. He was the most popular, most talked about. He was the highest paid athlete in the world at his time. And so, and he, but, but he was most known for talking. He, he, invent, he arguably invented trash talking to the point where guys like Conor McGregor have copied his style of trash talking into promoting fights, even down to his photo shoots. There's a, a Sports Illustrated cover on the left with Muhammad Ali. Conor McGregor on the right copying his style. 
so Muhammad Ali's influence on sports is still felt today. He, he was kind of this larger-than-life guy. And here's a quick video of him doing what he did, bragging and trash-talking. And you, George Fullman, all of you chumps are going to bow when I whoop him. All of you. I know you got him. I know you got him picked. But the man's in trouble. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hell. This is kind of what Joseph is doing. He's bragging, and he's telling his brother. Now, now this is, this is the youngest, uh, the 11th of 12th brothers. So he's, he's the, kind of the baby boy of the family telling all of his big brothers, one day all of you guys are going to bow to me. That's kind of like what, he's, what Muhammad Ali is doing. And his brothers get so sick of Joseph. They get so, uh, over, they're just so over this guy that they take him out into the wilderness, take him out into the woods, they beat him up, and then they sell him as a slave to a passing caravan of slave traders. Now, I know that uh, maybe your family has done you wrong in the past. Maybe they forgot your birthday. Maybe they didn't like your Facebook selfie. Uh, maybe they, they, they said they didn't send out Christmas cards, but then you saw one of their Christmas cards at, on Grandma's fridge. And, uh, and so that's messed up, right? But selling you as a slave, that's what Joseph's brothers did. That is serious family dysfunction and so then they go to their dad and they say dad we're really sorry uh joseph was eaten by a wild animal and so they take his coat they rip it up they cover it in blood they say look dad this is all we could get back was his coat joseph's been killed that is royally messed up and so joseph now is at his first fork in the road his first crossroads so joseph has gone from son favorite son celebrated son, spoiled son. Joseph has gone from son to slave. I don't know if your life has ever taken a turn like that, where on, in one day it seems like everything kind of fell apart and, and, you, and you thought you knew what was going to happen in your life and you thought you knew what direction everything was going and then all of a sudden things seem to be, have taken a terrible turn. So Joseph is sold as a slave and he has to walk to Egypt. Now, uh, along the way, uh, Joseph has to walk through the desert. He's in this caravan. He's walking through sand. Do you know what sand does? When sand blows, it polishes and rubs. It'll actually take paint off a car, uh, blowing sand. And, he, and this, on the way to Egypt, this sand is polishing Joseph too. It starts to wear down this arrogant young guy and the guy who was bragging to his brothers, the, the spoiled kid who was dad's favorite. We don't know how long it took. But we see when Joseph arrives in Egypt and as he starts living in Egypt, that somewhere along the way, Joseph responded to the persecution of his brothers by allowing God to change his heart. Instead of becoming bitter, instead of becoming angry, instead of telling everybody who had listened how it wasn't fair, how they did him wrong, instead of any of that, Joseph goes from, uh, jo Joseph goes from son to slave and he handles it well. He's teaching us a lesson. He chose to be refined by this process instead of destroyed by it. Joseph is reminding us what happened to Joseph was never as important as what happened in Joseph. Just like us, what happened to him wasn't as important as what was happening in him. And what happened on the outside was terrible, but he allowed God to start changing his heart. And that's exactly what God wants to do with us. So we see Joseph is sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar is one of uh, Pharaoh's officers. He oversaw all of Pharaoh's bodyguards, so he's kind of in Pharaoh's cabinet. He's kind of like in the president's cabinet, and he's wealthy, he's powerful, he's well-known, and Joseph ends up working in his house as a house slave. But look what God does because Joseph refuses to become bitter. This is what happens next. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted, and he entrusted him with everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household, of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So Joseph has gone from son to slave. He refuses to become angry. He refuses to be bitter about it. And God is with Joseph, and God prospers Joseph. He did so good. All of a sudden, he's blessed again. He's living a good life. So he's wearing Air Jordans again. He uh, gets to drive Potiphar's Mercedes every once in a while. When Potiphar's out of town, he gets to sit in his chair, eat his cereal, play his Xbox. So he's living a pretty good life. Things are going really well. 
The Proverbs talks about men like Joseph and people like Joseph. Look what Proverbs says about the righteous. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. Do you know what made Joseph righteous? The fact that he wouldn't stay down. In the greatest movie of all time, the greatest movie ever made, Rocky won. Uh, there's Rocky's fighting in the championship fight, and him and Apollo have been beating each other up for 14 rounds now, and uh, they're exhausted, and they're both beat up and banged up, and Rocky gets knocked down, and he falls on his, on his face right in his own corner, and his trainer, uh, his gruff old trainer, Mickey, who loves Rocky, uh, he, he tells him, he says something kind of surprising. He yells at him, down, down, stay down, because he doesn't want Rocky to get hurt anymore. And there might be people around you who love you, who are well-meaning, who have watched you suffer, and they're telling you you've been through enough, you've suffered enough, you've tried, in, 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 you've tried so many times, just down, down, stay down. But I believe that you're joining us online right now because God wants you to hear this. Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. So I'm telling you, get back up. Don't quit. Don't let your heart get bitter. You can stand up one more time. You're stronger than you think. You have more in your gas tank. You don't have the eye of the tiger. That's okay. You have the eye of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is even better. You have the eye of Jesus in you. And so uh, the Bible says that God actually lives in you. When you commit your life to Christ, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You have that power in you. So don't give up. The first crossroad that Joseph faced was from son to slave and he's doing great he's accepted it and he's dealing with it well he's admired by everybody he works with maybe admired too much because here's what happens next now joseph was well built and handsome and after a while his master's wife took notice of joseph and said come to bed with me Ooh, i just sprayed myself in the face (laughs) So uh, she says, come to bed with me, Joseph. If you read the original Hebrew writing, come to bed with me, meant the same thing that it means now, all right? She was being uh, nasty, okay? She was a, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, this Greek word, uh, cochina. She was being a cochina, all right? So uh, look what Joseph does. Okay, so now Joseph has been done wrong. His life did not go the way he wanted it to, the way he thought it would. So he's been done wrong. So Joseph could have easily and justifiably done it. But look what he says. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. This lady, Potiphar's wife, is a cougar. She's from Cougar Town. And she's chasing Joseph around. And even though Joseph finds himself in a place he doesn't want to be, he refuses to sin against God. Joseph recognizes that if he does this, he would be sinning against God. So he refuses to. He's, oftentimes, we respond to disappointment by justifying obedience. Let me say that again. Oftentimes, we we respond to disappointment and disappointment with God. My things didn't go my way. And, and so why should I try and keep serving God? Why should I keep trying to do the right thing? It didn't work out for me. So we justify our disobedience by sinning against God. And, but Joseph is, he takes that exact opposite approach. He's not like, well, God's not holding his end of the deal up. Why should I? He's not saying anything like that. He didn't say, well, I've been really good and nothing good is happening. He's not, he doesn't have that attitude at all. He recognizes that no matter where he's at, whether he's in his father's house or whether he's in Potiphar's house as a slave or he's in dad's house as a son, it doesn't matter. That does, his geography doesn't change his obedience and his relationship with God. And so whether he's at work, whether he's at home, whether he's with his friends, he still is serving God. And so he says again, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph could have easily done it. Nobody would have held it against him. If he would have turned his wife, his back on, on, his, on God, nobody would have blamed him. They'd say, well, you know, it didn't work out for you. It's okay. Joseph won't do it. And so eventually Potiphar's wife gets so overcome with lust for Joseph that she tries to physically 
uh, take him to bed with her. And Joseph, the Bible says, runs out of his clothes. He, she, she, he wiggles out of his clothes. She stays with his, with his, uh, like his jacket. And then she starts screaming and says, uh, Joseph's trying to rape me. And so he goes from son to slave to now he's been falsely accused of assault. And this is where the story picks up. Potiphar is so angry because he believes his wife. So Joseph, master, put him, took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. All Joseph has been doing is he's been doing the right thing, and that earns him prison. Sometimes we do the right thing. You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to make things right. You're trying to have integrity and honor, and it ends up costing you. That's okay. You're in good company. That's exactly what happened with Joseph. That's exa- that you're on, the, you're on the right track. You're doing the right thing. Look what, let's look at what Jesus said again. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Joseph is definitely being persecuted for, his, for righteousness. Now, the, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about is the whole, you know, here, the sweet by and by someday we'll be uh, in heaven with Jesus forever when we die. But that's not the only thing he's talking about. The kingdom of heaven isn't just some far off place with clouds and harps and angels. It's God's favor here today. So when we do the right thing and we're persecuted from it, the kingdom of the, we're persecuted because of what of doing the right thing. The kingdom of heaven is ours right now. It's favor at work. It's God showing up in your family. It's God showing up in your relationships. It's God showing up in your finances and honoring the work that you have done. Let's go back to to Joseph. Joseph ends up in prison because he did the right thing. And the same attitude that Joseph had when he was in Potiphar's house, he takes into prison and he starts encouraging the prisoners and he eventually takes over the prison. And then after a while, God continues because Joseph has such an excellent spirit that he goes from son to slave, slave to prisoner. And then the last transition that Joseph makes is he goes from prisoner. Joseph goes from prisoner to prime minister. Joseph eventually takes over the entire country. And he does that because he has that excellent spirit that refuses to become bitter. Sometimes in our lives, we justify our disobedience. We get upset with God. We say, it's not fair. Look at, but look at what Genesis says about Joseph. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord is with him and showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who he held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Joseph is, ends up taking over the prison, and now he's number one. And then he goes and takes over, eventually becomes the number one man in the kingdom. Genesis 49 says this. It's kind of summarizing Joseph's life. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Moses wrote the book of Genesis. He's telling the story of Joseph, and he summarized it. I love that picture where he says, Joseph was a... a, a vine that climbs over a wall. Have you ever seen those climbing vines? They are relentless. They just keep slowly working up brick walls, slowly working their way into the cracks, slowly making their way. That's exactly what Joseph did because of his integrity, because of his his pure heart. Joseph worked his way and just kept moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. Eventually, that slow, relentless faithfulness to God and that, that desire to continue walking with God eventually got Joseph to become the prime minister of Egypt. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. I know some of you, there are many joining us online, and you have, um, you have suffered because of righteousness. You've tried to do the right thing, and it didn't go well. You've, you've tried to have integrity, and you suffered for it. So we're going to pray. 
And I'm going to pray that the kingdom of heaven will move into your, into your life, into your home, that God would honor the fact that you're being persecuted for doing the right thing. Let's pray. Father, uh, this morning, I pray for every person joining us here online. God, there are times when we want to do the right thing, we try and do the right thing, and it doesn't feel like it works out. So, God, I pray, Lord, that you would show up in the lives of your people and that the kingdom of heaven would advance and land in their lives. I pray for favor in their families, favor at work, favor with their bosses, favor with their customers. I pray, Lord, favor in their finances and with their kids. Lord, I pray that as they continue to stand strong and have that that character and that integrity that Joseph did, that, Lord, you would make up the difference and that you would bless them, Father. We love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we're going to finish this morning's service with an opportunity for you to give. And um, I know this isn't ideal. We we obviously don't want to be only online. We love seeing you guys. We miss you this week. Um, but we're so glad you're staying home and staying safe and staying warm. Um, please don't go out if you can avoid it. Um, but we're going to end this service this morning with an opportunity for you to give. And if this is if you're joining us online for the first time this morning, this part of the service isn't for you. Uh, we're just so glad you're joining us this morning. But if you do go on Mosaic, your home, uh, we just want to remind you there are a few ways you can give. You can give online at our website at greeleymosaic.com. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can give on the Church Center app. Um, I suppose if you want to swing by this week and drop your offering off at the church, uh, you can do that also. But um, I just want to encourage you to remain faithful. Uh, whatever God has placed on your heart, to stay faithful to that and and watch the ways that he changes your life. So let's pray over this morning's offering. God, we thank you for this day, Lord, and God, we thank you for, for all that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for, for a warm place to sleep, Lord, for the clothes on our backs, Father, for all that you do for us. God, we, we pray over this morning's offering, Lord, that you would take it, that you would multiply it, that you continue to advance your kingdom everywhere Mosaic is active, Father. We give to you this morning out of a joyful and a generous heart, Lord. Thank you for all you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, before we wrap up, we never like to finish the service without giving you the opportunity to give your life to Christ. The whole reason that Mosaic Church exists is to connect people to Jesus and help them grow in their faith. And so if that's you this morning, obviously you're not here, but you can still say this prayer, okay? This isn't something that you have to be at church to do. So if you'd like to give your life to Christ this morning, I'm going to just ask you to pray along with me wherever you're at. Just bow your head and say, Dear Jesus, this morning I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I pray that you'd wash me and make me new. Help me to walk this new walk and make me more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. Guys, have a great, great week. Stay safe. Um, if you can, stay home. The roads are really, really bad. They're really slick. And so we don't want to see anybody uh, get in any accidents or get hurt or anything like that. And so we love you guys. Uh, we will be in person next week um, for both our 930 and 11 o'clock services. So we'll see you then. Have a great week.